<clears throat> okay, good morning. Hopefully you've all turned your homework in. It's due now. So if you have it, turn it in, pass it forward. And there is a new homework assignment on the board. Um, there's actually two homework assignments. One is not due until after or at the time of the exam, but both of these topics will be covered on the exam. So today as we proceed through Chapter 5, we're going to be doing a lot of examples of engineering problems with steady state devices. And then that last little section in Homework 8, those um, 100 level problems, those are actually unsteady flow devices. And there will be at least one problem on the exam that's unsteady flow. So it's important to, both, to understand both steady and un unsteady. The majority of the exam will be about steady state devices, but there will be some on there with, with unsteady flow. So get started on this homework early. We're going to be doing a lot of examples in the next several classes up until the exam. And there's even a, like a review date scheduled for next Thursday, which uh, will give us more time to do additional problems and examples. And if you're struggling with the examples, following them in class, you're going to struggle on the homework and you're going to struggle on the exam. So make sure that you understand the fundamental steps that are involved. If there are things that are, are plaguing you that you really don't get, it's that now's the time to ask, start asking questions. Yes, Samuel. Yeah, yeah, it's in class. Um, it will be a normal class period, and I've I've built that into the schedule because previous times we've had like a snow day or something that messes things up. Um, this time we haven't had any snow really at all, nor snow days or cast, class cancellations. Um, but I also have a lecture that's prepared for that day that's just a review lecture, and so it's really helpful because we do just tons of example problems. I have you work some of those on the board too. So it's a really good session to not miss. If you feel like you know everything and you don't need it, then um, probably you're fooling yourself. So please come. Um, none of my lectures are mandatory, but I think they're all recommended. So today, continuing on in chapter five, we're talking about steady state devices. And we've, we've just, I guess, briefly defined steady state devices in the past, but um, it's really important to understand the difference between a startup phase and steady state. So most engineering devices do have some sort of a startup period. So when you turn on a hose, the water doesn't come out immediately. So it doesn't reach max flow until maybe a few seconds after you've opened that nozzle. The same thing happens with engineering devices. So as you start your car or as, you, as a turbine um, ramps up or a compressor, that there's this period of unsteadiness, um, which we actually will analyze later. We're starting with steady state because it's easier to analyze and it's um, what most engineering devices operate at the majority of the time. So steady means that the properties, both intensive and extensive properties, at any given point aren't changing with time. That does not mean the property values aren't changing with position. So the properties at the inlet may be very different from the properties at the outlet, but whatever those property values are at the inlet, they're staying the same for the entire time period that we're analyzing. Okay, so that's the difference between steady state and uniform. Um, so these properties can, can change, but not with time, just only across the control volume. So some consequences of that, it simplifies our, our energy balance equations. So if our uh, velocity is constant, then we don't have any boundary work. If our mass is constant, we have no mass accumulation which means that whatever is coming in is equal to whatever is going out. If our energy is constant, then there's no change in energy of the control volume with time, so whatever is coming in is also equal to whatever is going out. So these are the two forms of the general um, steady state uh, energy equation for the engineering devices that we'll, we'll study in this um, this class period, so we can write it in two different forms, Q in plus work in plus the, uh, the sum of the enthalpy in and the velocity in and the potential energy in is equal to all of those things going out. So instead of having the dm dt or the dq dt or the dw dt or de dt, um, all of those go to zero because they're not changing with time. So property values aren't changing with time. Um, the amount of heat coming in, the amount of work being done, none of those things are changing with time. 
So some examples, um, we, we have looked at this, for this example preliminarily um, in the last class period, I believe it was, where we have ductwork with a resistance heater and some sort of fan blowing through it. Okay, so if we imagine this is like a simplified model of a hair dryer, then that would be an example of something that could be analyzed as a steady state device. Similarly, we can have water tanks or any kind of a tank with an inlet and an outlet, and maybe there's uh, cold water coming in, hot water leaving, because there's some heating element in the tank that's increasing the, the energy of the fluid. Okay, so there's many different um, types of steady state engineering devices, and we're going to talk about a lot of them today, but it's still important to look at them and analyze all of the heat and work interactions. Okay, you may have heat and work interactions crossing the boundaries that you really have to consider. Additionally, you're going to have flow coming in and out of the system. So we need to think about all these methods of energy transfer and, um, and apply our energy balance in order to simplify things. So if we look at some of the terms within the energy equation, Q dot is the rate of heat transfer between the control volume and the surroundings. And we often look at Q dot as a negative value when the control volume is losing heat. And if a system is insulated or adiabatic, then we can assume that there's no heat transfer with the surroundings, or Q dot is equal to zero. W dot is equal to the energy per time, or the power. And if there's no boundary work during a steady state process, um, then this, this, this term comes into play only when we have like an electrical work or a shaft work. And then we need to know the time period over which it occurs in order to analyze the energy per time um, and turn it into a power uh, component. So if we don't have electrical work or shaft work, then we can assume that the work done is zero or that the power of that steady state device is zero. Similarly, we have enthalpy change in the fluid. And this is a combination, if you remember from before, as of the internal energy of the fluid as well as the flow energy that's required for that fluid to move through the control volume. And usually we can approximate it using our constant average specific heat, CP average equals T2 minus T1. This is almost always true when we have an ideal gas that the specific, um, the specific heat can be approximated as such. If we're working with a refrigerant or water, we have tables that give us those enthalpy values, and it's more accurate to use the tables in that case. Um, there are also select tables for ideal gases in our book, but in most cases they're given in terms of kilomoles rather than kilograms, so you'd have to convert from uh, unit systems using the molar mass. Kinetic energy, we're familiar with this term. Um, we just have to be very, very careful that we watch our units on that because 1,000 meters squared per second squared is equal to a kilojoule per kilogram. So you cannot just add a kinetic energy term to this enthalpy term that you calculated previously without first accounting for the unit. So be very careful about that. Um, and in practice, this value is often very small. So unless there's a significant velocity change with the fluid flowing through your system, we can often neglect it. Okay. However, if velocity is given to you in the problem, it's probably a good idea to calculate it just to make sure it's a term that's small enough to be neglected. And again, be very careful on the units because you may calculate some value that seems very big and significant, but if you're not uh, dividing through by 1,000 um, by, to account for the units, then you'll be misled. And then similarly, with the change in uh, the potential energy, is often a very small, um, a, a small fraction of the energy change within the system. So a delta Z of a 102 meters corresponds to a change in potential energy of one kilojoule per kilogram. So it would have to be a pretty significant elevation change through your system in order to um, really need to consider or, or use that term. So additional simplifications, we talked about some of these last time, that if it's single stream flow, meaning there's one inlet and one outlet, then the mass flow in is equal to the mass flow out. And we can rewrite mass flow or the mass flow rate as the density multiplied by the velocity multiplied by the area. And you have to take into account the velocity of the inlet when you're looking at the inlet, cross section of the inlet when you're looking at the inlet. Make sure that you're actually using the correct terms um, at either your inlet 
or your outlet because velocities in cross-sectional areas are not necessarily the same, nor are the densities. Um, and so we can, uh, we can look at this equation if we look at it as Q net in, which is Q in minus Q out, or work net out, which is work out minus work in, um, then we can rewrite the equation as such. And if we disregard or assume that the kinetic and potential energies are negligible, then we can simplify it even further, where we're just looking at the mass flow rate in and out and the enthalpy of that flow as it comes in. And so that is, that is the, the brunt of the energy change or the interaction within our fluid. It's just due to the enthalpy change and not necessarily any velocity or elevation changes. And of course, if there's no heat or work interactions, meaning it's an adiabatic system and there's no shaft or electrical work, then we can set those two sides of the equation equal to one another. Uh, where the enthalpy out is going to be equal to the enthalpy in, or out minus in is equal to zero. Yes? The m dot, is that the mass flow rate? Yes, mass flow rate. Yeah, so anytime there's an m dot, remember it's just that, that property value. So m, m is mass, which is kilograms. We put a dot over it, it means kilograms per time. So kilograms per second would be a mass flow rate. Um, so getting into some of the steady state devices, nozzles and diffusers are quite commonly used in, um, in engineering devices in practice, and they're often used to either diffuse the fluid or to increase its velocity. So a nozzle will serve to increase the velocity of the fluid, but it does so at the expense of pressure. So as that fluid velocity increases, the pressure of the fluid will decrease. And then the opposite happens with the diffuser, so it will increase the pressure of the fluid at the expense of the velocity. So if you want to, to, to speed a fluid up or slow it down, you would use either a nozzle or a diffuser. And typically, these velocities uh, or these, the fluid is flowing through these nozzles and diffusers in, in a rapid manner, such that the, there's not really any time for heat transfer with the environment. That's not always the case. Um, but in many cases, they're adiabatic. Typically, there's no work involved. There's not like an additional. Um, a pump or a shaft or something in there that's speeding up the fluid that happens either upstream or downstream. Um, and usually you can ne neglect the potential energy changes. However, because the velocities are changing so significantly through a, a diffuser or a nozzle, we can't neglect the kinetic energy term. So it is not zero. It's a non-zero term. Okay, so let's start getting into examples. As we talk about each of these devices, there will be one to two examples um, that help kind of solidify the concepts and show you how to analyze them. So in this case, we have a nitrogen gas that's flowing through a diffuser. Um, it, it enters at 60 kilopascals and 7 Celsius, and the velocity is 275 meters per second. Then it leaves at 85 kilopascals and 27 degrees Celsius. Okay, so we're, we know the inlet conditions, pressure, temperature, and velocity. So that V is, is not volume, it's velocity, which if you were unsure, you could look at the units to know that. And then it leaves at a higher pressure and a higher temperature. What do you think is going to happen to the velocity? Okay, it'll decrease. And why will it decrease? Yeah, yeah, it will. So, so certainly you can look at it in terms of the mass flow rate being constant and then those two sides of the equation. You would know that if the area is getting bigger, the velocity must be decreasing. Um, but also you would know that just because that's what a diffuser does. So if you understand these steady state devices and, and how they work, what they do, what their purpose is, um, then you can, you can know that. Okay, so we have nitrogen, which we can assume is an ideal gas. And in this case, we're going to... Um, neglect any potential energy changes. There's not really any elevation change. And we're told that the diffuser is adiabatic, which means what? There's no heat loss or heat transfer with the surroundings. Okay, so as we analyze this uh, problem, we can do it a couple of different ways. With nitrogen, um, we can either use constant average specific heats and calculate enthalpies that way or we can look them up in the table. And in this case, I looked them up in the table, but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. So steady state engineering device, what's the, the first thing we do after we've 
analyzed and set our system, we have inlet and outlet properties, where do we go from there? Um, well, V is velocity, not volume, so it wouldn't help us find V2. But there are other equations that we can use to help us find V2. So we're, if we're relating energy, so we want to know how this ener the energy of this fluid changes uh, across the control volume, what equation do we have that helps us do that? The energy equation, right. Okay, so you'll be writing this a million times in the next uh, several weeks. So Q dot in minus Q dot out plus work dot in minus work dot out is equal to M dot times H2 minus H1 plus V2 squared minus V1 squared over 2 plus the change in potential energy. Okay, so which terms can we neglect out of this equation? Okay, Q in, Q out, it's adiabatic, we have no heat transfer. Potential energy, what else? We want to cancel those out. No, we need to find these. Uh, indirectly, we'll use this to find the velocity, but it's important to know that the, the enthalpy of the fluid is changing because the temperature is changing, the uh, pressure is changing, so this is not going to be a zero term. But what else can we neglect? Work. Okay, do we have any work interactions? Okay, there's no shaft, there's no electrical wires. The work interactions are zero. So then our equation simplifies to just these two terms on this side of the equation. Um, so we have our mass flow rate times H2 minus H1 plus V2 squared minus V1 squared over 2 is equal to 0. This is multiplied all of it by m dot. And since at this point we, we could calculate m dot, but we don't know what m dot is, we can even just get rid of that if we want to solve for the velocity because we don't necessarily need that m dot to solve for the velocity at this point. Right, because it's we're just divide both sides through by m dot. Get rid of it. Because it okay. So if we are in part A solving for the exit velocity of the nitrogen, that's this term here. We know V1, right? It's given to us in the problem, 275 meters per second. Do we know H2 and H1? Or can we look them up somehow? Yeah, we can look them up. So what table is that in your book? Somewhere around there. It'll be between A17 and A25. So nitrogen, it's table A18. Okay, so from table A18, what's our T1? 7 degrees Celsius. And T2 is 27 degrees Celsius. Is the table in terms of Celsius? No. So what do we need to do? Convert it to Kelvin. So what's 7 Celsius in Kelvin? 280. Okay, so we just add 273. What's 27? 300 Kelvin. Okay, so now we can look up our enthalpy 1 and our enthalpy 2. And again, these are given in terms of the molar mass. So what's H1? Okay, so 8141 kilojoules per kilomole. And what's H2? 8723 kilojoules per kilomole. Okay, so we're also probably going to need the molar mass to convert. What's the molar mass of nitrogen? OK, 
Okay, so the molar mass is 28.013 kilograms per kilomole. Okay, kilograms per kilomole. Okay, so if I don't remember the exact uh, way to convert between this and this, I can look at units and figure out whether I divide through by m or multiply through by m, right? So in which, which would I need to do in this case? To get rid of kilomoles and have kilograms in the denominator. Divide. Divide through by m. So h1 over m and h2 over m to get the actual values in uh, kilojoules per kilogram. Yes? Okay. That's okay. It's okay to be wrong. All right. I'm wrong all the time. Okay. Um, so then we can just start rearranging our equation, solving for V2. So if we rearrange V2 is equal to H1 minus H2, right? So if we move that over to that side, multiplied by 2 plus V1 squared, <coughs> squared. So we'll get rid of these and do the square root of that, right? So V2 is equal to the square root of 2 times H1 minus H2, and then we add on this V1 squared. So if we pl put in the numbers for that, converting um, H to kilojoules per kilogram by dividing our molar forms by the molar mass, put in all the numbers for that, uh, then we get the following. So this is the square root of 2 times 8141 minus 8723 divided by 28.013 kilograms per kilomole. That's kilojoules per kilomole. Plus this V1 squared, which is 27, 275 meters per second squared. H1 minus H2. Then I have a negative. Yeah. Then that. Um, It all works out. <laughs> so, because you can't, if you take a square root of a negative number, then you're going to have a radical. But if this is, you subtract this and then take the square root of the whole thing. So, um, this is squared. But we have to be careful about our units because this is in meters squared per second squared, and this is going to be in terms of kilojoules per kilogram. So, we multiply through by 1,000 meters squared per second squared divided by a kilojoule per kilogram. Okay. Why did I divide through by the molar mass? Because, yeah. Yeah. Because if I wanted, if I wanted this in terms of kilojoules per kilogram, I have to divide through by M to cancel out the kilomoles and just get kilograms in the denominator. Um, so you're talking about right here? Yes. Okay, so H2 minus H1, if I'm solving for V2, I can move this to this side of the equation or this to this side of the equation. If I move this over here, then I get a negative V2 squared. If I move this over here, then I just flip H1 and H2. So either way, there's a negative sign that somehow has to get worked out. So I just, I did that. And these, um, this, this term becomes negative here underneath the square root, but when we add on this, this 275 meters per second, then it, um, it's like the same as if I were to just do 275 minus this value, and then take the square root of the whole thing. It all works out. What? Yeah. So this is 275 meters per second squared, square root of it. 
Yeah. 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 It works. Okay. Okay, so we do those numbers and we get that V2 is equal to 185 meters per second. Okay, so that's part A of the problem. Part B is the ratio of the inlet to the exit areas. So how do we find that? Whether, what other equation do we have at our disposal or other information do we have that allows us to look at how those areas compare? This was conservation of energy. Yeah, so conservation of mass. That m dot 1 is equal to m dot 2, or that rho times velocity times area 1 is equal to the density times the velocity times the area of the outlet. And we can either use density or we can use specific volume. So we could also write it as um, velocity divided by specific volume times area is equal to the velocity divided by the specific volume multiplied by the area. This is two. Yeah. Okay, so how would we determine any of these property values or how would we find these ratios? We want to find A1 over A2. So A1 over A2, we just take this and divide through by A2 and then move this to the other side, is velocity 2 over velocity 1 multiplied by specific volume 1 over specific volume 2. All right? You follow my algebra. So this for an ideal gas, we could go ahead and just calculate specific volume um, for state one and two, or we can put it in there symbolically. So this is the same as this V2 over V1, velocity two over velocity one, and R T1 over P1, R T2 over P2 because we can look up R from the table. We have the temperatures and the pressures at the inlet, at the outlet. Okay, so to solve for the specific volume, we put in all the numbers for that, then we get 0 0.887 is our ratio of areas. So the inlet area is 88% of the outlet area, 89%. Because density is equal to the reciprocal of specific volume here, right? So to go from here to here, density is equal to 1 over specific volume. So this step to here, I just said, OK, I don't, I don't like using density in these equations because I never solve for that. I'm going to use specific volume. And then when I'm uh, dividing through by A2, I move this to this side of the equation. And I can move this to this side of the equation, but I have to flip it. So anytime you divide through by something, you have to flip the denominator and the numerator. Um, this one. Those, those. Okay. So here, let me let me do one more thing. So um, I'll do it a step at a time, so that you can see it. So I could say v1 over specific volume one times a1 over oops, A2 is equal to this velocity 2 over specific volume 2, okay? So then if I want to move this over to the other side of the equation, I could say um, A1 over A2 is equal, okay, I'll do it, I'll do it all the steps. I could say V1, A1 over A2 is equal to V2 over V2 times V1, okay? So then if I want to move that one over, A1 over A2 
is equal to V2 over specific volume, so velocity over specific volume, and then specific volume over velocity. But I, then I just group like terms, which I can just rewrite this as V2 over V1 and V1 over V2. If you follow all that. It's just algebra. I mean, um, it gets tricky just because the Vs are, you have to make them distinct, but there's nothing um, too fancy about that. Okay, does everybody sort of understand this problem? So in general, when you're approaching a steady state problem <coughs> with these steady state engineering devices, you apply the energy equation and apply the mass balance equation or the mass flow equation. Okay. So um, increasing the, this, these will go like in, in levels of increasing difficulty. That a nozzle is nice because there's no heat transfer, there's no, um, there's no work interactions, but now we're going to look at a turbine and a compressor which looks similar to a nozzle, and they have some of the same functions as far as like slowing down or speeding up a fluid, but um, the purpose is to get some work output or uh, some, some pressure change within a fluid. So as a fluid passes through a turbine, um, generally there's a, some sort of a blade on the inside that as the fluid passes over it, it spins a shaft which provides some work output. So this is the basis for like hydroelectric, hydroelectric power in a dam or um, like in a power plant, they, the whole purpose of like coal or uh, natural gas is generally to heat something up to then run it through a turbine and gener generate electricity. Yes? So this, how a How a what? Gen? Oh, jet engine. Uh, jet engines are different. Um, Yeah. Yeah, jet engines are like um, they have diffusers and turbines combined. It's it's slightly different, but it's. Uh, yes and no. Yeah, it's yes and no. But um, we do talk about jet engines later when we get to um, like the diesel cycles and things like that. So. That comes later. It's it's similar. There are a lot of similar concepts, um, but it does operate slightly different because with the uh, yeah, it's it's providing thrust, which is slightly different than shaft power. Um, so as a fluid passes through this turbine, it generates work, and then usually that shaft is somehow connected to a, a generator that will then generate or produce electricity. Um, but compressors are used to increase the pressure of a fluid. So you may have used an air compressor to fill up your tire, or if you have any sort of like a pneumatic uh, nail gun or, um, or other device that connects to a pneumatic, uh, to a compressor, um, it's used to just provide a high pressure air or water source for some other purpose. Um, and typically we can neglect any heat transfer, not always, uh, and usually potential energy changes are very small unless um, we're dealing with like a hydroelectric dam, in which case there are some significant elevation changes sometimes going through those turbines. Um, and the change in kinetic energy for compressors and usually for turbines is negligible. Um, sometimes with a turbine you have significant velocity changes as well, so sometimes you have to consider it. But the work input and the work output, depending on which one you're looking at, is not zero, that there always will be a work interaction when you have a turbine or a compressor. Knowing whether it's a turbine or a compressor will tell you whether it's work in or work out. So let's do an example of this. So starting with our basic energy equation again, Q in minus Q out plus work in minus work out is equal to M dot times H2 minus H1 plus V2 squared minus V1 squared plus that change in potential energy. Okay, so let's look at this problem. We have steam entering an adiabatic turbine at 10 megapascals and 500 Celsius, and it leaves at 10 kilopascals and a quality of 90%. So quality of 90%, what does that mean about the fluid as it's leaving? It's a mixture, okay? And is it mostly water or mostly steam? Mostly steam. Okay, so it comes in as superheated steam and it leaves as 
ideally a super or a saturated vapor, but if there's some water mixed in with it, then that sometimes happens. For turbines, it's actually um, can be damaging if there's too much um, liquid within the steam as it leaves. Okay, so we know the inlet and outlet conditions. What we don't know is the mass flow rate, but because we know the, the rate of power output, we can use our energy equation to solve for it. So we're neglecting kinetic and potential energy changes, and we're assuming that because it's adiabatic that there's no heat transfer. So how do we start this problem with the energy equation? Okay, so what terms can we cancel out immediately? Okay, Q in, Q out, there's no heat transfer. Throw away that pin. Q in, Q out are zero. What about work in? Okay, there's no work in. Is there work out? We certainly hope so because that's the whole point of a turbine. What about change in enthalpy? Will there be a change in enthalpy? Yes. What about kinetic energy? Yeah, we'll just assume that it's negligible. We don't know anything about the velocities coming in or out. Uh, we don't know the inlet or outlet areas, so there'd even be no way to calculate the velocities. So we just assume that those are negligible. So all we're left with is a negative work out, work dot out, is equal to m dot times h2 minus h1. Okay, do we know this value of work dot out? Okay, do we know H2 and H1? We don't know them, but we can find them. Okay, so we'll need to go to the property tables to figure out these values. And then what about M dot? That's what we're solving for. Okay, so this is our, our, own, our only real unknown because we can find these H2 and H1 using the property tables. Okay, so let's go to the superheated steam table and at state, or not state one, we'll say at the inlet, what are our property values? So we have a, a pressure of 10 megapascals and a temperature of 500 degrees Celsius. So what is our enthalpy at state one from the property tables? Three three seven five point one kilojoules per kilogram, and where did you get that? Table A six six. Yeah, okay. So then for the outlet, our pressure is ten kilopascals, and what is our quality? 0 0.9, what is our enthalpy at that state? Or how do we figure it out? Yes. So H2 is equal to H sub F plus X times H F G. So we can go again to the property tables and look up H sub F and HFG, we find H sub F is equal to 191.81. HFG is 2392.1. So if we calculate H2, we get 2344.7 kilojoules per kilogram. Yeah, so anytime you're given a quality, that automatically tells you you're looking at the saturated liquid tables. And because we're given pressure but not temperature, then we'd use table A5 because it's given in terms of pressure. Okay, so these values are from table A5 at a pressure of 10 kilopascals. We look up HF, we look up HFG, and then using this relationship with the quality, we calculate H2. Okay, so now our only unknown is m dot. So we can solve for m dot is equal to, and I'm going to do some of that tricky math again to get rid of the negative sign, work dot out over h1 minus h2. So 
if we put in the numbers for that, five megapascals is equal to what in term, or five megawatts is equal to five what, how many kilowatts? If I have kilojoules, then I want kilowatts. 5,000. Okay, yeah, be, be careful with that. So 5,000 kilowatts divided by H1 minus H2, so 3375.1 minus 2344.7 kilojoules per kilogram. So a kilowatt is the same as a what? Kilojoule per second. So I'm double checking my units that I get rid of kilowatts. I have kilojoules per second. Kilojoules cancels out. Kilogram is in the denominator of the denominator, so it moves up. And seconds goes to the denominator. So I have kilograms per second, which is what I want for m dot. So we calculate those numbers. We get m dot is equal to 4.8. 5.2 kilograms per second. And in all of these steady state problems, they're going to give you different combinations of information at the beginning and ask for some different combination of stuff at the end. So maybe they give you the mass flow rate instead of the power output. Can you calculate the power output? Yeah. Okay. So. In all of these problems, you're only going to have one, maybe two unknowns, okay? But you have two equations at your disposal to allow you to, to solve for, for whatever it is. So if, for example, um, you solve the energy equation and you have that m dot and work out or unknowns, you also have the mass balance equation that may be able to help you find the mass flow rate, okay? So maybe they've given you a velocity and a, an inlet area or something like that then you can use the other equation to try and solve for the mass flow rate. Put it into this equation to solve for the energy output. And then in some cases, maybe instead of asking, or instead of having you solve for the power output, they have you solve for the pressure at the exit. Okay, so how would you do that? Well, you'd go through this and you'd solve for H2, and if you knew maybe the temperature, or you knew that it was a saturated liquid vapor mixture, then you could use that information and solve for the pressure. Okay, so all of these problems, no matter what they throw at you, it's all going to follow the same basic process to solve for it. Your unknowns are just going to be different. So anytime you see a problem like this, don't get worried or scared. Just start writing down what you know and then apply the energy equation to figure out what you don't. Okay, so let's do another one. This one, instead of a, tur of a turbine, it's a what? What is it? It's a compressor. And how do you know it's a compressor? <laughs> if you just saw a picture, how would you know? Yeah, so it's going from a lower to higher pressure and there's a shaft work in instead of a work out. So even if it didn't say so in the body of the problem, you would know that it was a compressor. Okay, so we have helium coming in at a pressure and temperature of 120 kilopascals and 310 Kelvin. That's nice of them to give it to us in Kelvin. And then leaving at a pressure and temperature of 700 kilopascals and 430 Kelvin. Then they tell us that a heat loss occurs of 20 kilojoules per kilogram during the compression process. Neglecting kinetic and potential energy changes, well, it says neglecting kinetic, but it doesn't tell us anything to figure out potential either. Determine the power input required for a mass flow rate of 90 kilograms per minute. Okay, so we know the inlet and exit properties, and we can assume that helium is an ideal gas. That's just one that um, we, if we don't know, then now we know that helium is an ideal gas, because I told you that. Um, so we need to apply the energy balance and figure out some of this other stuff. So we don't know how much work is going into the system, but we can calculate it given all of this other information. Okay, so again, we start with our energy equation, Q dot in minus Q dot out plus work dot in minus work dot out. You should have this memorized by now if you don't already, equals M dot 
times H2 minus H1 plus change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy, which we are going to assume are both zero. Okay, so on this left-hand side of the equation, what can we get rid of? Q in. There are no Q in. Is there a Q out? Yes. Okay, and that Q out looks funny to me. Why? It's not a Q dot out. What is it? It's a normal little lowercase Q. So we'll have to deal with that in a minute. What about work interactions? Okay, there's a work in. Is there a work out? No. Okay, so all we're left with is negative Q dot out. Minus, uh, plus work dot in is equal to m dot times h2 minus h1. And we're given m dot, right? So that's known. We, do we know the work in? But we're going to find it. We're going to solve for that. Do we know q dot out? We know it sort of. Okay, we have a lowercase q that's in kilojoules per kilogram. We'll have to figure out how to convert it to a q dot. Um, and do we know H2 minus H1? Okay, we can look them up. We don't have a table for helium, but we have another process that we can use to find enthalpy for an ideal gas, if you remember doing that on your homework. Not for helium specifically, but how do we do that? Yeah, so a C sub V, no, C sub P times T2 minus T1. So we can calculate that too. We just need to look up the C sub P. Okay, so Q dot out. How do we deal with this thing here? What do you think? We want energy per time, but what we have right now is energy per kilogram. So what relates kilograms and time for flowing fluid? The flow rate, okay? So Q dot is equal to M dot times this lowercase Q. Pretty easy, right? Because we can also think of it that a big Q is equal to M times lowercase Q, okay? And if we just put the dots over those, then the same equation also holds true. So that's not that difficult to deal with. We can figure, or we can know that. So if we solve for work dot in, it's equal to this m dot times h2 minus h1 um, plus lowercase q, right? So we just multiply m dot times q. We divide, we uh, distribute that through. Okay, and then we also talked about how this h2 minus h1 we can rewrite as C sub P times T2 minus T1. Okay, so we now know all the values on this side of the equation. We know M dot, we can look up C sub P, we have 2T, T2 and T1, and we have this lowercase q. So if we start putting in the numbers for that, M dot is 90 kilograms per what, minute? Okay, I don't like that. I'm going to convert one minute to 60 seconds, so I'll have it in terms of kilograms per second. C sub P, if we look that up in the back, we use 5.1926 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. That's the C sub P for helium. And then our temperature, T2, is 430 Kelvin minus 310 Kelvin plus this Q term of 20 kilojoules per kilogram. It's right here. So one, two, three. Yep. That's M dot. It's multiplied by everything. It distributes through. Q dot didn't leave, it just is Q dot Q times M dot. That's what happens when I skip steps, I lose you. 
No, so I didn't skip a skip step. I just did that. So m dot times q is our q dot, right? OK. So then if we plug in all the numbers for this, we're double checking our units. So I'm going to have kilograms per second here. This is going to be kilojoules per kilogram because the Kelvin gets rid of kilojoules per kilogram. So kilojoules per kilogram times kilograms per second should give me kilojoules per second. So w dot n is equal to 965 kilojoules per second or kilowatts. Okay, any questions on that example? Yeah, it would be the, the height difference between the inlet and the outlet. Yeah, and then the same for kinetic energy. It's just the velocity difference between the inlet and the outlet. So in this case, like with a closed system, when we had to consider kinetic and potential energies, it was the kinetic and potential energy of the system itself. So like the system itself had to drop off a cliff or something to have a velocity or a change in potential energy. In this case, we're considering the uh, kinetic and potential energies of the fluid itself. So how the, the velocity changes or the elevation of the fluid changes. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right. So throttling valves, <coughs> this is another engineering device that's often used in refrigeration systems. Um, and it's like a flow restricting vice that causes a significant pressure drop within the fluid. So this pressure drop is achieved without doing any work to the fluid, which is kind of nice. So by forcing it through this, um, this, this throttle or this um, restriction, then it, it decreases the, the pressure without having to use like um, a pump or a, a fluid accelerator or anything like that. Okay, so um, generally that pressure drop is also uh, accompanied by a large drop in temperature. And for these, these uh, throttling valves, the work is zero, the heat is zero, the change in potential energy is zero, and the change in kinetic energy is zero. So if we were to do the um, energy balance, this Q in, Q out, cancel out, work in, work out, cancels out, the potential and the kinetic energy cancels out. So we're just simply left with M dot times H2 minus H1 is equal to zero. So then we can rearrange that and uh, divide through by the mass flow rate to find that H2 is equal to H1. So this is called an isenthalpic device. So iso meaning uh, static or no change. So then we know that the uh, because enthalpy is equal to the internal energy plus the pressure times specific volume, that we can equate those two uh, on both sides of an equation. And if it's an ideal gas, then enthalpy ends up being a function of temperature only. Okay, so um, we we uh, can look it up in the tables, and uh, there's no um, variation of the enthalpy due to pressure changes um, if it's an ideal gas. So that was something we talked about in the last lecture. So let's just do a quick example with an isenthalpic device. And again, we start with our basic energy equation. Even though we sort of already know where it's going, it's always a good idea to start at the beginning just in case, make sure you get proper signage on your uh, equation. I'm going to close this door because of the glare. It's still there. OK. <coughs> so Q in cancels out. Q out cancels out. Work in cancels out. Work out cancels out. Kinetic and potential energy cancel out. So we have m dot h2 minus h1 is equal to zero. I can divide through by the mass flow rate and just find that H2 is equal to H1. So in this case, we have R134A at 800 kilopascals and 25 Celsius. So let's go to our R134A table. And at 25, uh, let's see, at 25 Celsius, our saturation pressure is somewhere between 640 and 680. So am I starting out with a saturated refrigerant or superheated or compressed? And how do I know? Okay. 
So if we look at table A12, at 800 kilopascals, our saturation temperature is 31 Celsius. So am I higher or lower than the saturation temperature? Lower. So what would that mean? It's a lower, so it'll be a liquid, right? So it's a compressed liquid. Um, we don't have tables for that, so we have to do what? What's that? Uh, interpolation, we would interpolate if we had a table. We don't have a compressed liquid table for superheated or for saturated, sorry. We don't have a compressed liquid table for R134A, so what do we use instead? Yeah, so we use the saturated liquid tables and we make the approximation that at that same temperature, at 25 Celsius, that the, um, the enthalpy value will be approximately that of That thing. Okay, hold on. So at state one, it's kind of annoying because it's actually in between two values on the table, 24 and 26 Celsius. I don't know why they didn't put 25 in there. But if we make that uh, approximation, P1 equals 0 0.8 megapascals, T1 equals 25 degrees Celsius, then H1 is approximately equal to H sub F at 25 degrees C, and by interpolation, we find that it's 86.41 kilojoules per kilogram. Okay, so we know H1. What's H2? H2 is H1, right? So does that mean that the, the state doesn't change at all? No, okay. So this is 25 Celsius and H1. What's at state two? What happens at state two? The temperature drops significantly, so it's negative 20. State two is negative 20 degrees C and 86.41 kilojoules per kilogram. Okay, so how do we find whether that's a compressed liquid or superheated, how do we figure it out? Okay, go to the tables. So if we look, let's just start in the saturated liquid table. At negative 20 Celsius, what is H sub F and what is H sub G? Okay, so So H sub F is 25.47 kilojoules per kilogram, and H sub G is 238.43 kilojoules per kilogram. So the value of 86.41 is in between H sub F and H sub G, which means that we have a what? Saturated liquid vapor mixture. Okay, so we want to find the pressure at the final state. What is the pressure at the final state? How do we know the pressure? Crickets. We have a saturated liquid vapor mixture and we know the temperature. How do we find the pressure? PSAT, right? It's just the saturation pressure. So PSAT is equal to, in this case, 132.82 kilopascals. Okay, now how do we find the internal energy of the final state? We know the enthalpy. How do we figure it out? We know we're somewhere under the dome, right? Somewhere in between this line. We know our enthalpy value. What do we need to know before we can find internal energy? The quality. We, or the specific volume. 
because uh, internal energy is equal to H minus P sub V. So if we knew the specific volume, then we could calculate it because we know the pressure. But in order to calculate the specific volume, we have to also find the quality. So let's find the quality is equal to H minus H sub F over H F G. So if we calculate that, this is H2 minus H sub F over H F G, we get it's 0 0.2861. Um, and then we can calculate our internal energy is equal to U sub F plus X U F G. So if we plug in the numbers for that using the U sub F and the U F G values from the table at negative 20 Celsius, we get 80.74 kilojoules per kilogram. U, yeah, UF and UFG from negative 20 degrees. Because we're at state two, we're at the negative 20 Celsius. So it's just the saturation values at that point. Okay, now interesting to look at though, um, as Dejan mentioned, enthalpy and internal energy are related by the specific volume and pressure. So we can go about this another way. We could calculate the specific volume so V sub F is equal to 0 0.0007361 meters cubed per kilogram. And V sub G is 0 0.14735 meters cubed per kilogram. So using the, the quality, we can solve for V2 is equal to uh, this 0 0.0007361 meters cubed per kilogram plus 0 0.2861, which is the quality, multiplied by Vg minus Vf, which is 0 0.14735 minus 0 0.0007361 meters cubed per kilogram. So we calculate V2, specific volume 2, is 0 0.0427 meters cubed per kilogram. Then I can calculate U2 is equal to H2 minus P2 V2. So H2 we solved for previously. We found it to be, oh no, H2 is equal to H1, so we looked it up. So it's 86.41 kilojoules per kilogram minus P2, which is 132.82 kilopascals multiplied by V2, which is this 0 0.0427 meters cubed per kilogram. And if we calculate that, we find U2 equal to 80. 0.74 kilojoules per kilogram, which is what we found before um, using the quality, which proves that thermodynamics is true. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? All right. So the next several lectures, we're going to be going through a lot of examples um, like this. And it's so important that if you are struggling to understand the examples we do in class, that you talk to me, talk to a friend, figure it out, because um, you need to understand this process of solving these problems, because it will be the same regardless of what they throw at you. If it's a, a turbine and certain conditions are given and they're so you want to solve for the work uh, output, or if you need to solve for the mass flow rate, or if you need to solve for an outlet condition, that you follow the same basic procedure and understanding what you do know, what you don't know, you can solve for any of the other components. I mean, there are problems they could present that would be um, 
unconstrained, meaning they don't have enough information for you to solve it. But all the ones I assigned for homework and all the problems on the exam will be, um, they'll be solvable. So if you get stuck, think that. This, this problem has a solution. I just need to be methodical about it and start working with the energy equation to figure out how to get there. So good luck. Get started on this homework early. It's a big assignment. Um, so get going.